Hi everyone, I'm Greg Gorga, Executive Director of the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. And we are so happy to be a part of the virtual Maritime Festival with our good friends at the Ocean Institute in Dana Point and all the other maritime organizations throughout the United States and the world. You know, we opened our doors in July of 2000, 20 years ago. And in that very first year, we started working with the Ocean Institute to bring their tall ships up to Santa Barbara to do educational programming. And it's been a great relationship throughout those 20 years. So I'm going to show you a little bit about the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum and our local history. I hope it inspires you to come visit us soon. And I hope you enjoy the festival. Come on inside. Let's take a walk down the Schuyler family historic path and learn about the early days of maritime history here in the Santa Barbara Channel. We believe that our maritime history started over a thousand years ago with our local Chumash, uh, Native Americans, who were one of only two civilizations to build plank canoes. Everybody else built dugouts. And they would have used redwoods that floated down from Northern California. If you look inside there, there's like staples. That's this shrub over here, dogbane, that they would shred, twist, and then cover with a mixture called yap or yap. And that was pine tar and asphaltum. And that was also used to seal these planks together. They would have built these on a beach just east of Santa Barbara uh, that is now known as Carpinteria, so named because the carpenters were building these tamales there. And then they would have gone out to the Channel Islands from Port Wyneme area and they would have hopped the islands over from Anacapita, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, San Miguel. They would not have gone likely across from Santa Barbara. It was too long and too rough. They used these rocks for ballast and they would collect fish and things like that and then throw them off uh, the rocks overboard as they gained weight with the fish. Now the Chumash were very good users of the natural resources. We talked about Yap, or Yap which is pine tar and asphaltum and Santa Barbara is the home to the second largest natural oil and gas seeps in the world. And that's the, the asphalt or tar has been bubbling up here for thousands of years and you'll still see it on our beaches when you walk along there. Uh, and so we talk about uh, those natural seeps here uh, in our Geology of Oil exhibit. They also use shark skin to sandpa uh, sandpaper to work on the boards of the tamal. They used uh, shark skin for tools, the tar for drilling tools. And the other major thing they used uh, asphalt or tar for was they would weave baskets, put clumps of tar in the bottom, then throw in hot rocks, swirl that around, and they could carry water. And so you could see how far and wide the Chumash civilization traveled uh, because they are one of the few civilizations to be able to carry fresh water on, on a regular basis. And so uh, we believe that they are going out to the Channel Islands uh, for uh, thousands of years on those tamales. So it always amazes me that less than 50 years or exactly 50 years after Columbus was on our east coast, the Spanish were exploring our west coast. And our first Spanish explorer was uh, Juan Cabrillo. Uh, who came up through here in 1542. And of course, he actually saw the tamal that we just talked about and uh, commented about those um, and how maneuverable those were. So the Spanish came through for uh, quite a bit of Escaño, Portola. So this area is, uh, I, what I love about this is a lot of the things are low to the ground for kids. We try to be very interactive so things light up. We also have an otter pelt. And if you've never felt an otter pelt, they have more hairs per square inch than any other animal, uh, over a thousand per square inch. And so they're very soft and they are in high demand. In fact, the Russians were coming down from Alaska towards uh, California um, and, and were hunting otters. And the Spanish were very scared about the Russians taking over this coastline. And so that's why we started building presidios, San Diego, uh, in Santa Barbara, uh, San Francisco, was to stop the Russians from coming down uh, in, during the otter pelt period. Over here we talk about uh, the world's first offshore oil wells, which were right here in Summerlin in the very late 1800s. 
They would build piers out into the uh, ocean because they saw that gas and uh, oil bubbling up there and, so, and then would drill down from those piers, dozens of, of drills. And those were the world's first offshore oil wells. Then they also were mining tar uh, along the uh, coast here in Goleta, Carpinteria, uh, even earlier than that. And that tar was taken all over the country, San Francisco, Los Angeles, even as far as New Orleans, was using asphalt and more tar from uh, this area to pave their roads. And so we have a long history with oil here in, the, in this area. Over here is one of my favorite stories. Richard Henry Dana was a, a college student back in New England, had eye issues, doctor told him to go get, take some walks every day, and instead, he signed up as a common sailor on a ship called the Pilgrim to trade hides and tallow. And they went on a two-year voyage around Cape Horn, and their very first stop in Alta, California was right here in Santa Barbara. Uh, Dana wrote a, a, a book about that called Two Years Before the Mast, became an instant bestseller. It has never been out of print. And in fact, Melville corresponded with Dana when he was writing Moby Dick. Uh, he did not think very highly of Santa Barbara. He called it a dusty, desolate place. Uh, but they were collecting hides, up to 15 to 40,000 hides. That's how they stored them in the ship. Uh, they were also collecting uh, the animal fat, uh, putting those in bodas, and then going up and down the coast as far as San Francisco, north down to San Diego, uh, back and forth until they had enough hides to head back to um, the east coast. We bring a tall ship up every year from the Ocean Institute and put fourth graders who are studying their California history on a tall ship and they read that an abridged version of two years before the mast and live the life of an 1830 sailor. And it is a great experience. Uh, you wanna teach some kids some responsibility. They all have different jobs on the boat. Uh, they have to cook breakfast and dinner for everybody, do night watch, go out on a dinghy uh, and look for hides that the crew has hidden and if you want a lesson in patience, try to get six 10-year-olds to row together. Uh, and so Dana is a, a very important part of our hit maritime history here in Santa Barbara. So now it's time to show you what I believe is the most significant maritime artifact in the Santa Barbara Channel, and certainly the pride and joy of the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. Behind me there, is the first order Fresnel lens from Point Conception Lighthouse. And Point Conception is the demarcation between Northern and Southern California. It's where California goes from a Northern Southern orientation to East to West. And so it is the most dangerous waters on the West Coast. In fact, some people call it the graveyard of the Pacific or the Cape Horn of the Pacific. Not unusual for 30 to 40 foot swells out there, heavy, heavy fog, and 60 to 70 mile an hour winds, and a lot of shipwrecks in that area. And so when California became a state, and the government sent surveyors to the west coast to see where to put lighthouses, Point Conception is the very first spot they went to. And they built the lighthouse there on an upper bluff. It started construction in 1854. This lens was being built at the same time in Paris, France. It was shipped around Cape Horn, and then uh, to San Francisco, then to Coho Beach, and first lit at the lighthouse on February 1st, 1856. And we call it a Fresnel lens because it was designed by Augustine Fresnel. Before that, they used Argan lamps. And Argan lamps had a, a flame, they had a mirror behind it, and they would reflect that light source and capture about 15% of the light source. Fresnel realized that light was a wave and he developed these glass prisms and he took all that light source through these glass prisms and directed them into a single beam of light and it revolutionized lighthouses. Uh, before that, a light could be seen five miles off. This lens, burning oil, could be seen 25 miles out to sea. This one in particular is very unique. It has 16 bullseyes. Those are those round circles up there and it has 624 individual pieces of glass. Fresnel lenses worked just like grandfather clocks. In fact, the company who built this lens, Henri Lepeau, was at one time the official clockmaker for the King of France. And so they would attach a weight 
to the clockworks and every four hours the keeper would climb a stairs and wind that weight up and then as it fell down through the middle of a spiral staircase it would turn the lens. So let's turn this lens. See how slow it's turning? So this lens, every lighthouse has a different signature or characteristic because if you're out at sea in the middle of a dark night especially in stormy seas it's great to see a lighthouse but you really want to know exactly which one you're looking at. The signature of this lens was it would make one full turn every eight minutes and that means it has 16 bullseyes that means every 30 seconds you'd see that beam of light come across your ship your bow uh, uh, for two seconds and you would look at your chart find point conception and it say on the chart two second flash 30 second interval and that's how you knew you were at Point Conception, you weren't seeing the lighthouse at Point Arguello or at Anacapa Island. So, uh, and then there was a lantern over here that would burn oil. So originally they used rapeseed oil, uh, which grew everywhere in France where these were invented, not so much in uh, the United States. Then they went to kerosene. So they would pump the oil through here, fill it up, uh, they are constantly trimming this wick, and it was a five wick system. So old lighthouse keepers were nicknamed wickies. This lens is 18 feet high. It weighs about 6,000 pounds. And we had to use three lampists. Those are the official uh, people who can work on a Fresnel lens, uh, authorized by the United States Coast Guard. Uh, and they took two weeks out of Point Conception to take this apart and three weeks sitting right here, cleaning it three times and putting it back together. And this lens, I believe, saved thousands of sailors' lives during its 150 plus service at Point Conception Lighthouse. You know, it seems like from the first time humans went out on the oceans, mermaids have been a part of our maritime culture. And so we are very excited to have on display right now an exhibit called Mermaids, Visualizing the Myths and Legends by photographer Ralph Clevenger and five of his students from his time as a professor at the Brooks Photography Institute. wonderful way to express our maritime history through art. You know, at one time, 90% of U.S. sailors had tattoos. And of course, they first came from the South Pacific with Captain Cook, uh, but sailors were sailing uh, all over the world and they would see these tattoos in the South Pacific and want to get them. And they had meaning. So sailors got a swallow on their chest if they did 5,000 nautical miles a second one if they got to 10. They put the tall ship on their chest if they went around Cape Horn, the hula girl if they got to Hawaii, uh, the turtle if they went across the equator. They are also very superstitious. So back in the day of sails, they would uh, bring live animals on board, pigs and chickens, mostly in crates which tended to float in a shipwreck. So sailors would tattoo a pig and a chicken on their feet, thinking that would save them in a shipwreck. They'd also tattoo the cross or Jesus' face on their back because in those days they were still getting whipped and they thought they wouldn't be as whipped as hard with Jesus on their back. So, so they had some meaning. In fact, you know what? I think I'm gonna get a tattoo right now. Come join me. We have our tattoo artist here and he could do about four different tattoos and I'm missing my mom today so I'm gonna get one for her.
The best thing about this tattoo is it doesn't even hurt. Oh, he should color it in though. Oh, there we go. That's looking much better.